so today we're going to have a look at section 21 of the Theft Act, which is blackmail. So, the definition of blackmail is this. A person is guilty of blackmail if, with a view to gain for himself or another, or with the intent to cause loss to another, he makes an unwarranted demand with menaces. Now, to split that down, we first off have the actus reus. So the actus reus is made up of a demand, which is unwarranted, and is made with menaces. The mens rea, with a view to gain for himself or another, or with intent to cause a loss to another. So the mens rea, it's an either or. You might have both, but you don't necessarily have to. So you've either got to have a view to gain for himself or for another, or the intent to cause a loss to another, or you might have all of the above. So let's first off look at what the demand is. So first of all, we have the case of Collister and Warhurst, note the date, which states that the demand for the purposes of blackmail may be expressed or implied. So you might out and out make a demand, or it might be implicit in what you're asking for. This means that if the demand is unwarranted, the actus reus is complete as soon as the demand is made. The victim doesn't necessarily have to hear it or receive this demand. You might make a phone call to them to the, and it might be that you've typed the number in wrong. You might send an email which goes straight into their spam account and they never actually see it. But as soon as the demand is made and it's unwarranted, then the actus reus is complete. Uh, Treaky and the DPP also illustrates this point. Um, our defendant posted a letter containing a demand with menaces in England to someone in Germany. Even though the letter would not be open until it arrived, the House of Lords said that the defendant could be guilty of blackmail in England as that was where the letter was posted. So we need to have a look at the idea of menaces one of the more complex ideas, I think. So first off, if we look at Thorn and Motor Trade Association, this is a useful case that will pop up a couple of times. Um, menaces is a strong word suggesting a high degree of coercion to give rise to criminal liability for blackmail. So it has to be quite a serious thing. Um, and the case of Aaron Harry said that menacing pressure is often used to demonstrate the level of severity required to amount to blackmail. There is no requirement that the one who is making the demand is to be the one carrying out the menaces, nor is it a requirement that the person making the demand is in a position to carry out the threatened action. It all comes down to the fact that that, that threat was actually made. We also have to have a look at the case of Garwood. Um, the test as to whether a particular threat amounts to menaces is objective. However, where the victim is particularly vulnerable or of a timid nature, the jury may find that menaces existed where the defendant was aware of the effect of his actions on the victim. So we are looking at an objective test based on the perspective of the reasonable man, but we are going to consider our particular victim as well. So let's have a look at the unwarranted nature of that demand under section 21.1. So under this section, the demand is unwarranted unless the person believing, uh, making it does so in the belief that he has reasonable grounds for making that demand and that the use of menaces is the proper means of reinforcing that demand. It's what the defendant believes that what matters and it's a subjective matter. So our defendant has to genuinely believe that he has the right to make that demand and that menace is the, is the only proper way of reinforcing it. Um, hopefully it's not something you've ever experienced but if you've ever seen bailiffs on the television you don't see them going up to somebody's house 
politely knocking on the door and saying, please may I have this back, you haven't paid for it. You do tend to see quite a lot of aggression and they are using menaces to get whatever that they need. But assuming they've gone through the proper channels, which we don't really need to worry ourselves about, they are allowed to do that. They don't have to be polite. And in some cases, they can use reasonable force in order to take what it is that they are supposed to take. And what is key is um, both of the beliefs for an unwarranted demand must be held. You can't have one or the other. You must believe that you've got the reasonable grounds and that menaces is the only way that you're going to achieve that. And this is something for the jury to decide. So once again, Thorne and the Motor Trade Association, there was an extortionate fine attached and this was an unwarranted demand for these purposes. So just to summarise the actus reus, we have three elements. We start off with the demand. And once the demand is made uh, with menaces, then the actus reus is complete. And it doesn't necessarily ever have to reach the victim. Um, it needs to be unwarranted. And we've said the exception that it's not unwarranted if our defendant had reasonable grounds for making that demand and the use of menaces was the proper means of reinforcing it so bailiffs for example and menaces and this has to be something that an ordinary person would be influenced or made apprehensive so as to meet the demand um, and the defendant knows the victim will be influenced or made apprehensive as seen in Garwood. So your victim doesn't necessarily have to ever hear it or be moved by it, but the ordinary person certainly would be. And the defendant knows this. So that's the actors rares, people. So moving on, the men's rare. With a view to make a gain or intent to cause a loss. That's what we are looking at. So section 342A, and yes, before anybody asks, you do need to know the section numbers for your exam, defines a gain and a loss as including only gains or loss of money or other property. So if we look at the case of Bevans, the gain or loss need only be temporary. And again includes keeping what one has and the loss includes not getting what one might get. But we are looking at the loss of money or other property. So let's look in more detail at the mens rea. As we say, our defendant must be acting with a view to gain for himself or for another or with the intent to cause a loss to another. It must be money or property. It can be temporary and no gain or loss actually needs to occur as long as the defendant um, had the required intent, this is enough. So let's have a look at a couple of cases. You don't need to write down every single word on these. Please don't try and write everything. Um, but I've included all of the facts for you so that you can really get a feel for what exactly happened. So this was a case called Jita. Um, in this case, our defendant, D, is in a relationship with C, the complainant. So the complainant started receiving these threatening text messages um, and she was frightened by these. But unbeknownst to her, the messages were actually sent by her boyfriend, the defendant. Nice guy. So as you would expect, the complainant confided in her boyfriend and he would comfort her and promise to keep her safe. In fact, so much so that he told her that he had gone to the police and made a complaint about these text messages, which actually he hadn't. He fabricated, so he made up text messages, which he said came from the police, and he convinced her to hand over a thousand pounds which he led her to believe was the cost of police protection. Um, there was the issue of, well, was this blackmail? 
and the court said he he was convicted and he appealed and his conviction was upheld on appeal what the court said was the appellant was responsible for the menacing pressure which led to the complainant to part with her money so clearly this was blackmail next up is the case of lambert so the um the appellant was owed money by Aaron. He phoned up Aaron's grandmother and pretended to be Aaron himself. And he claimed that he had been tied up and kidnapped and his captors were demanding £5,000, which just happened to be the amount of money that the appellant was owed. Um, he was convicted of blackmail and he appealed saying that since in making... in that since in the making of the call he had not made any threats towards Aaron as he was posing to be the victim of such threats neither was he in any power to carry out such threats he wasn't Aaron he wasn't the kidnappers it was all made up on appeal his conviction was upheld and the court said there is no requirement that the person making the demands is to be the one who carries them out or even that they are in a position to carry out the threatened action. The key thing was that they made that particular threat with a view either to make a gain for themselves, which Lambert was, or to make a loss for another, which he was, um, by view of the grandmother. So there are a couple of defences that we need to know about. This is probably the trickiest part um, because obviously if you get to use these specific defences to the offence, then you're not going to be guilty. So the defences, and we've looked at these before, is that you have a reasonable grounds for making the demand and the use of menaces is the proper means of reinforcing that. So to summarise, here is a summary of our mens rea. Starting at the top, and you do need all of these, um, the defendant acts with a view to gain for himself or another and or he acts with the intent to cause a loss to another. This gain includes a gain by keeping what one has and a loss includes a loss by not getting what one might get. The gain or the loss must be of property or money and it could be a temporary gain or loss and no gain or loss actually need occur. So that's it people. Uh, the next few slides are going to be some activities for you to have a look at. Make sure that you've taken down all the notes in the appropriate sections. Make sure that you've reviewed those notes and that you really understand them before you start forging on to the activities. Any questions, let me know.